Good morning. It's good to have you with us as we gather this morning to worship. But let me give you a few announcements regarding life in the body, and uh, then we'll have our young people open us up with their song. Youth, tonight at 5.30 downstairs in the lobby, we'll begin with food and some fun, and then we'll head out to the Moorhead Farm to finish out there. So join us at 5.30, work out all the plans for travel, carpooling, whatever you need uh, here this morning, and we'll be ready to enjoy tonight. Women of Grace, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock at Vicki Dallin's home. You can sign up in the lobby. If this is new to you, please pick up the flyer or ask anybody and make sure that you're able to enjoy that evening of fellowship. Uh, there's a wedding on Saturday at 2 o'clock. You're invited. Uh, please come. We'll look forward to... to that whole event and um, uh, again every everyone's invited and so uh, please come and celebrate with us uh, I think are the children practicing afterwards too? five little fingers the little little ones apparently if you're singing five little fingers uh, you come up to this uh, the stage here right after the service and you'll practice your song and that'll be followed by the youth and adult choir practicing. So if you didn't join us Wednesday for practice, you can join us today, be singing next Sunday. Um, one of the songs we're singing this morning, you're gonna know the tune pretty well, I think, The First Noel. Uh, if you know Christmas carols well, that song has a number of verses, most of them about the star and the wise men that are not necessarily unbiblical, maybe just kind of a little bit more imagination. We're going to sing today uh, four verses of the first Noel that are actually a newer text that bring in a little bit more of the purpose of the incarnation. So when we start singing that song, realize the words are not going to be the traditional words that you've seen. So you'd be ready to sing the first Noel with a little bit more of the whole story of the life of Christ. Uh, pray for Wes. We just heard this morning that uh, the, the trailer that he was staying in had some kind of fire, and so uh, I don't know the extent of the damage or what we'll have to do to try to help him out uh, in this coming weeks, but um, pray for Wes, and we'll uh, let you know if you can be a help in meeting any needs there. Also be praying for Shelly's family. Her stepdad, in all likelihood, will die today. Uh, they had to make the decision to remove him from uh, life-saving measures, the effects of COVID have gotten to the point where they just cannot give any more oxygen, cannot keep them on a respirator. Shelly's mom has to decide today to undo those things. Uh, family's coming into town, uh, but in all likelihood, this will be a heavy day for the Perkins family. So pray for them, uh, the extended family, uh, and pray for Shelly too as she recovers from her knee surgery. Uh, so many needs. Uh, the darkness is great, um, but the light is greater. And so we rejoice that we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, he came to make all these things right. So children, remind us that we should go and tell this good news to all who will hear.
Well, amen. Thank you, children, for that song. That was wonderful. All right, for the call to worship this morning, we'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians 9, 13 through 15. <clears throat> they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do come this morning with hearts full of praise and thanksgiving for the inexpressible gift of Christ you've given us, for the surpassing greatness of your grace toward us, for the many gifts we have in Christ. You've given us a renewed heart. You've given us a renewed mind. You've given us access to your throne. You've given us joy that is beyond any and that cannot be taken away. We're thankful for the gift of Christ. We're thankful for this season. We can come and remember his birth for us, the life that he's lived for us, the death that he died to pay for our sin. Thank you for all Christ has done. We praise you this morning that we can gather together to worship you and pray we would worship in spirit and in truth as we glorify our Savior this morning, for we pray in his name. Amen. In Christ, God and sinners are reconciled. We'll sing of that truth as we stand and sing, Hark the Herald Angels.
Scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 79. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the God, the Lord of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Let's go to God confessing our sins this morning. Holy Father, we come to you as a people in need of forgiveness. We confess that we have acted all too much like the world in our daily lives. We've carried on with cares and concerns of temporal things without having minds fixed upon you. Lord, even as we look at the evil world around us that you've saved us out of, we recognize that we're a people as a nation that are self-absorbed, covetous. Our own government preys upon that very covetousness to enslave us to itself and get us to follow its own devices. And yet, Lord, if we would just follow your plan, be obedient, these things would not be possible. Lord, even as your people, we find ourselves falling into these traps, captured by many things going on around us, unsettled, full of anxiety and fears, instead of being courageous, understanding that the kingdoms of this world are the kingdoms of our God. So forgive us for our anxieties. Forgive us for our worries. Forgive us, Lord, for worrying about tomorrow. You've promised that not even a sparrow falls from the sky, except that you take notice. And so why should we worry? Father, we've been captivated by so many things that have taken us away from thoughts of you. We have failed. And we do fail daily to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so we ask that you would forgive us of this horrible neglect. Forgive us, Lord, where our thoughts are scattered to everything except for you, for what you want of us in a given day. Forgive us, Lord, when we want something different than we know what you've shown us you have for us. Forgive us for hating our circumstances when you've clearly presided over them. Lord, we're short-sighted in wanting relief instead of wanting your will. Forgive us for not saying your will be done in all circumstance. Forgive us, Father, when we've been greedy. Forgive us where we have been selfish and self-centered in our communications with other believers with the lost world, with family members, has been less than what it should have been in order to please you. Forgive us, Father, where our minds are clouded by the darkness of sin. We're tempted and led astray. Lord, I pray that you'll cause each one of us to come back confessing the particulars of what we need to confess this week. Help us to walk as people of light, people of salt, to show that to our families, to show that to the people around us. May Jesus be seen in us in the coming week. 
Lord, even as you've called us to do so, we ask that you would help us to howl and mourn and wail over our sin. I pray that we will mourn about it, that we'll see it the way you see it, that we'll not dismiss it or have an excuse because of some other wrong done to us, some circumstance we may find ourselves in, but rather help us to see the wickedness of our hearts. And I pray that once we've seen that, we'll confess and then we'll go into the joy that you provide. May we truly be marked by people who mourn for sin and then turn and enjoy the joy of the Lord. May Jesus be glorified in all that we say and do. In his name we pray. Amen. In our assurance of pardon, beautiful verse in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world as a babe in Bethlehem. Let's stand as we sing again of his birth. Affirmation of faith is from Isaiah 35, prophetic words that speak to the hope of the incarnation and the work of Christ on our behalf. Congregation, you're invited to read the text in bold as we survey. Isaiah 35, this is the word of the Lord. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice. It shall blossom abundantly with re and rejoice with joy and singing. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. 
and a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, thank you for the work of Christ. Thank you that this text, with all of its hope and symbolism, has come true in Jesus. Thank you that the unfolding of rightness, of recompense, has begun. And thank you for the hope that is ours that you will complete redemption in the day of Christ's coming, that all unrighteousness will be made right, that your kingdom will prevail. Father, we come to you through the merit of this Jesus, your Son, our Savior, and we come to you with the help of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we come boldly before the throne of grace to ask for help in our time of need. We're tired and need your strength. We're uncertain and need your wisdom. We're broken and need your healing. Some are fearful and need your peace. Others tempted and need your truth. We are easily distracted and need your purpose too easily dissatisfied, we are in need of your true joy. Remind us that in the dark streets of our lives, the everlasting light still shines. Remind us that this light has pierced the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Lord, would you bless the light giving ministry of our partners, the farmers serving in Cambodia, the Schroders there in Alaska, the Webbers laboring on behalf of Ghana. Multiply their efforts, sustain them, strengthen their faith, increase their joy, and do all of this to make your name great among the nations. Lord, guide our friend Jeremiah through the trials of medical need and persecution. Would you supply every need for Wes in this moment of trial? Would you comfort Shelley's family on this difficult day? Lord, we thank you for the many simple pleasures of the season, for family, for friends, gifts, for flavors, for traditions, for nostalgia. But may each of these point us to the insurpassable joy of being known and loved by you. Open our eyes this morning to see in your word the wonder of your gracious gifts to us through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing once more before we open the word.
We'll begin in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. When we hear a sermon in the Christmas season about three gifts, we might typically think of the Magi with their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those gifts and their givers are certainly worthy of our attention since God made a point to tell us about them, uh, but that's not our study this morning. This morning we look at three other gifts with no less of a Christmas flavor because they carry the very purpose of Christ in His coming. We're continuing on in our series of what we teach, the Grace Bible Church Doctrinal Statement. And we begin in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, where the Bible says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, we'll spend our time on the second part, the free gift. But that only makes sense when we remember the sin and death of the first part of the verse. That key word of contrast is in the middle. The wages of sin is death, but something different from that phrase is going to happen in the next phrase. The gift of God is eternal life. Likewise, we best understand the theme of Christmas light shining in the streets of Bethlehem when we first understand the darkness of those streets. So in a sense, we're building on our study from last week, the truth of depravity. We studied that depravity, the depravity of sin ruins every person. In Adam, we all sinned and therefore we all died. But we also saw that sin ruins every part of every person. So we are dead in sin, unable to turn to God, the darkness into which the light must shine. So as Romans 6 tells us, yes, the payment for sin is death, but our verse continues, the free gift of God is eternal life. This makes us stop and think about what the Bible says regarding what sinners must do to receive the free gift. It almost makes our minds hiccup a little bit. We, we hear it's the free gift of God, but we also know what that means from the rest of Scripture. What is it that sinners must do to receive the gift? Jesus announced it when he began his ministry, Mark 1.15. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. And throughout the New Testament, we'll see those two requirements for receiving a free gift, repentance and faith. But here's the problem. To enter the kingdom, we must turn from darkness to the light. Yet John 3 reminds us that as sinners, we love the darkness and hate the light. So something needs to change in us or else we will just keep on rejecting the light. Even though the mandate of the gospel is repent and believe, we won't do that, John 3 says. Light came into the world and we love darkness rather than light. So something needs to change in us or else we will keep on rejecting the light. For you to say that you believe in Jesus and that your faith is resting in Him and that your hope is eternal life in heaven with Him, for you to be able to say that, something changed in you to enable you to love light and not be purely a hater of the light. Indeed, something needs to change and that something is our first of the three gifts this morning. The gift of regeneration. The gift of regeneration. Re means another or again. So another generation, 
another birth, another beginning, regeneration. What is it? Well, let me give you a definition and then we'll look at some scriptures. Regeneration is when God gives spiritual life to a spiritually dead sinner. It's another life, another birth. They were born once and life came into those lungs or air came into those lungs for the first time before it was living in that world of fluid as a babe in the womb. Born and life is there. The first birth. We're talking about another birth, another life giving. God gives spiritual life to the spiritually dead sinner. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If we're believers in Jesus, John 1 tells us, it's because we were born by the will of God. James 1.18, of God's own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So God recreated something. We're the first fruits of this new creation. How did he do that? By giving us life. When we were dead in sin. 1 Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some of you are old enough to remember Jimmy Carter being President of the United States and in his campaign, the language of being a born again Christian became popular in evangelical circles. Well, just to make, make it real clear, there's no such thing as an unborn again Christian. Um, and really you're being redundant in saying that to be born again is to be the Christian. But what does this born again mean? Do we really understand this gift, which Peter says is according to his great mercy, this gift of regeneration? God giving life to a spiritually dead sinner. We should know something of regeneration. First, because we see it in prophecy. You could look at Jeremiah 31 for the language of the new covenant written on new hearts. But it's even more clear in Ezekiel chapter 36 when God says of a day coming, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules." Ezekiel longed for a day when the people of God, by instinct, by new nature, would know God and walk in his ways. Ezekiel longed for the people of God to be a new creation. And though he didn't know exactly what that would look like, the New Testament tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that we are a new creature in Christ. We see it in prophecy, and then we see it in illustration. Look over with me at John chapter 3. A story that we're familiar with, but it, it always just seems a bit mystical. What is Jesus talking about? John 3, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see 
the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? It's not a legitimate concern. He's, he's throwing that question out there to point to the absurdity of this phrase, being born again. Jesus answered, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel and yet do not understand these things? Jesus says you must be born again. A rebirth, a regeneration. Because that which is born of the flesh is flesh. We understand that first birth, but do we understand the second? The second birth of the Spirit. Nicodemus was struggling to comprehend this. And Jesus says, oh, so you're a teacher of the law, but you've forgotten what Ezekiel said. And when Jesus speaks here of being born of water and the Spirit, my first thought is Ezekiel. I know some want to say, well, maybe that's the water of the fluid in the womb, and you're born that way first, and then you're born of the Spirit. Perhaps so. I feel a stricter help of interpretation comes from Ezekiel when God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and I will put my spirit in you. You'll be made alive. Like a valley of dry bones called to life by the spirit of God. So Nicodemus is having to grapple with what it means to truly be dead in sin and to be made alive in the spirit. And then Jesus goes on to say, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where the wind's coming from or where it goes. You don't see it, but you see the effects of it. With our temperature changes in the last few days, there's been a lot of wind. And you see the leaves tumbling across the yard, but you don't see the wind. You only see its effects. And so it is with the rebirth. You don't see the Spirit's regenerating work, you only see the effects, the sinner's cry of repentance and faith in Jesus. Have you been in church so long and had a Bible in your hands for so long and yet still don't understand the necessity and the wonder of being born again? How do we enter the kingdom? By repentance and faith. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, you can't even see the kingdom, let alone enter it, unless you were reborn. So in a sense, he's telling Nicodemus, listen, there, there is no hope of you repenting and believing unless the wind of the Spirit blows and there is new life. You won't even see the kingdom, he says first. Secondly, he adds, you won't enter it. So you enter the kingdom by repentance and faith, but you're not going to do that unless there's new birth, unless the Spirit works. We need life before we can respond Godward with any inclination of confession of sin or faith in Jesus. We need life and affections awakened by life in the Spirit before we can ever treasure Christ as valuable, as a Savior, as a Lord. The rebirth, regeneration comes first and from it flows repentance and faith. 
We've talked about this before. It's a distinguishing mark of reformational churches. They're not going to list in their doctrinal statement that we believe salvation is by faith in Christ alone and when a sinner repents and believes, he is born again. We don't believe that. We believe that salvation is by faith in Christ alone, but until the Spirit brings life, there will be no repentance or faith. So that God can always say his action on the sinful heart was first, lest any man should boast. We see it in this illustration that God gives to Nicodemus, but next we see it in real life. Over a few chapters to John chapter 11, where we read in verse 38 that Jesus was deeply moved again and came to the tomb. It's the tomb of Lazarus. His dear friend who has died, been wrapped in grave, grave clothes, laid in a tomb, and he's been there for several days. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Verse 44, the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Lazarus isn't going anywhere until Jesus gives him life. Lazarus' hope of obeying the command, come forth, was contingent on the life-giving power of Jesus' words. And so too is our obedience to Jesus' command to all sinners, repent and believe the gospel, contingent on the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. How can a dead man respond? How can one dead in sin respond to Jesus' command, repent and believe? The story of Lazarus, the teaching of Nicodemus, the prophet Ezekiel are all helping us to understand what must take place. We need life awakened in us. We see this in the New Testament teaching. Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Verse 5, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive. In the old King James, Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. He made you alive. In the hospital, when things get really bad and the machines start going off and you hear that steady beep, they bring in the crash cart and they fire up the electricity and they jolt that heart back to life. It's regeneration. The Spirit of God in mercy, shocks us back to life because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Let me add here that you know this idea of regeneration from the most famous Christian song ever written, Amazing Grace. John Newton wrote, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." and grace my fears relieved. You see, first there is fear stirred. Grace awakened Newton to the condition of his sinfulness before a holy God, and the rightful response is fear. Grace taught my heart to fear, and then we see that fear subdued. Then by God's grace, he was introduced to the hope of repentance and faith. 
and grace set them on that path of believing. You see, gift number one is the gift of regeneration. When God graciously gives spiritual life to the spiritually dead sinner, thus awakening the affections to be able to treasure Christ and respond in repentance and faith. Now let me introduce the second and third gifts with a text from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 as Paul speaks of the conversion of the Thessalonians, how they came to faith in Christ. And he writes, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. This verse gives us both of our next two gifts in the language of turning. Turning. You see, if I started out driving to church this morning and got a couple miles down the road and then realized I forgot Evan, perhaps, I would turn around and go back and get Evan, right? Well, am I turning away from church or am I turning to home? You'd say, well, it's obviously both. You're not going to church anymore and you're going to home. So it's away from church and to home. That's our understanding of repentance. It's a turning, but there's a negative aspect, the away from, and a positive aspect, the toward. So it is in the turning of conversion. I'm turning away from sin and turning to Christ. It's repentance and faith. So let's consider a second gift as the gift of repentance. Repentance is a turn from sin. It's the negative aspect of the turning. Paul says you turned to God, but it was from idols. We turn from sin. But here again, go back to what we know of depravity. Remember, you don't turn from darkness if you have a heart that loves it. If your heart is trapped by sin and you are dead in sin, in essence, that's all you know and that's all you want. But if you have a new heart, and if Ezekiel is true that God washes you and puts a new heart in you by His Spirit, you'll turn to a new love. You'll repent. You'll say, I don't want this anymore. I want this. Here's what seems to be a great mystery in the evangelical church, that repentance is a gift of God. We're, we're more prone to say that conviction of sin would be a gift from God, that that would be his mercy to convict us of sin, to chasten us back to righteous living. But let me just give you the simple language of Scripture that tells us repentance, though our responsibility as sinners before God, is his gift to us. Acts 11, verse 18. When they heard these things, what the apostles had been teaching, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life, everlasting life. Remember, how does anybody have eternal life, everlasting life? By repentance and faith. Where do they get that repentance and faith? From God. He grants it to them. Most of you will grant a gift to someone in this season. Maybe a thank you to a boss, maybe a gift to your child, to your spouse, to a grandmother, to a neighbor with some cookies or baked goods. You'll give it to them. We understand giving. So will we recognize the scriptures tell us that repentance is granted to sinners by a merciful God? 2 Timothy 2, 
verse 25, we're to be correcting our opponents with gentleness, and here's why. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, being taken captive by him at his will. Your neighbors, your co-workers, your family members who don't know Jesus are ensnared by the devil, taken captive at his will, and we're to entreat them with gentleness and the love of God, perhaps because God will be merciful and grant them repentance. You must repent to be saved. If you are saved today, you repented. But that repentance is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. All of those things we take as God's truth and we accept them by faith, even though our minds will struggle with, how can it be my responsibility and yet God gives it? And I'm not going to answer that. (laughs) It's just what the Bible says. It says of those who don't repent of their sin that they will stand before God and not hear the words, I'm sorry, I didn't give you repentance. God will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You loved your sin and wanted nothing of Christ. Sinners are responsible before God to repent of their sin. If you're saved, you repented of your sin. But simply hear the scriptures that God in his mercy granted repentance to you. You can never boast in your repentance or claim it as your own. You received it as a gift. Finally, there's the gift of faith. What is faith? It's the positive turning. I'm turning to Jesus Christ. Because by this life-giving spirit, I've seen the horror of my sin and the death that it merits, and I've also seen the work of Christ. He kept the law for me. He died on the cross for me. He rose from the dead for me. So because of Christ, I can be righteous before God, I can be forgiven before God, and I can have his promise of everlasting life. I see all of that in Christ, and I turn to it. I want it. I trust it. But it's the same turn. As the van would swing around to turn from church back to home, so is this conversion. I'm turning from sin and to Jesus. Faith is a turn to Christ. And now be reminded from the scriptures that faith is also a gift. John 6, 44, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up in the last day. Verse 65. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. It's a gift of God. Acts 16, 14. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to hear what was said by Paul. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one would boast. Philippians 1, 29, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Two gifts. You were given faith and you were given discipleship that leads to even suffering and a deeper identity with Christ. It was granted to you to believe. So again, like repentance, you must believe to be saved. If you are saved here today, It is because you have believed. 
You have trusted in Christ as your Savior. He's Lord. That's clear in the Bible. But it is also clear that you can never boast in your faith or claim it as your own. You received it as a gift. And how again can it be my responsibility and yet God's gift? Our only hope is going back to the reality of depravity, that we were truly dead in our sin and could do nothing. Not only as nothing in, as far as merit, but nothing in even response to the merit of Christ. Christ could be sufficient for all sinners for all eternity. But if we're dead in sin, it means nothing to us. Christmas says God gave the gift of Jesus and his saving work accompanied by the Holy Spirit means that we are given new life, regeneration, so that we can receive the gifts of repentance and faith so that in all of this work of salvation from beginning to end, there is nothing I can point to that speaks to my ability my capacity, my inclination, my preference for, my response to God. It is all His work. So that for all eternity, we will praise the Lamb and will never say anything like, well, I came to faith because when I saw it in Scripture, I just knew that no, we won't have any eyes to speak of. There won't be any need for me to be mentioned. It will be God in His mercy gave life. God in His mercy granted repentance. God in His mercy let me treasure His Son when before I only hated Him and killed the light when it came. How can that be? That a hater of light is now a lover of light. And the answer is new life in Christ, abundant and free. It's the gospel. It's the gift of Christmas. And while gold, frankincense, and myrrh always get center stage, repentance and regeneration and faith are gifts of God in Christ for eternal life. We close in 2 Corinthians 4, where Paul writes, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So what hope is there for a wayward son or daughter? What hope is there for your family members? If the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the gospel, what hope is there? Paul continues, but God said, let light shine out of darkness. And that God has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. God can awaken dead hearts. God can shine the light into the darkness. So perhaps today God is showing you the depths of his mercy in saving sinners. Perhaps you for the first time are understanding that you've sinned against a holy God. That would be God's mercy in your life, showing you your need for a savior. And today is the day of salvation. So the Bible says, repent and believe the gospel. To those who have faith in Christ, brothers and sisters, the God who spoke the universe into existence spoke light into your darkness. Maybe you remember when it was. Maybe it was a, a, a season that you look back on and can remember when you were being awakened to truth. He gave you the gifts of new life, repentance, and faith. He did for you what you would never do and could never do for yourself. Is it any wonder we say to each other, good Christian men and women rejoice 
with heart and soul and voice. Christ has opened heaven's door and man is blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. He was born to pierce the darkness. He was born to bring the dead to life. So thank you, Heavenly Father, for your saving purpose in Jesus Christ. In these quiet moments, receive our worship for such undeserved favor that you have shown to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We offer our gift in return. Our worship, our obedience, our lives lived to the glory of our rescuer, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's take these quiet moments as the piano plays to bask in the gift of God, eternal life. So Merry Christmas. Jesus came to turn you a stranger into a child of God. So may we in word and in deed give thanks to God for his inexpressible gift of Jesus. Grace and peace as you go.